first time I saw the play, Hedwig and the Angry Inch, I was wondering, man, how are they gonna, uh, how are they gonna be able to turn this into a film? The movie develops out of the play. Don't you know me, Kansas City? The play was a musical. I'm the new Berlin Wall, try and turn me down. In the show, it takes place during one gig. And in the movie, it takes place over the course of a number of performances. It's a story about someone who has to go through extreme circumstances to find out who they are. Hedvig used to be a little boy in East Berlin and wanted to be free. In order to get out of East Berlin, he has a botched sex change operation and he marries an American GI. A year later, he ends up dumped in a trailer park. She forms a band and uh, meets Tommy, who she falls in love with and becomes his mentor. And she starts teaching him about music and they fall in love. And then he up and leaves her and becomes a huge rock star. One of the threads that runs through her personal life is her belief that that each person has this sort of mystical, cosmic other half that if they find in their lifetime, they will achieve wholeness and happiness. She hooks up with this young boy, Tommy, who has ambitions to be a rock star. He shows up at, at one of her gigs. He hears her sing this song, and he's really captivated by the song, both because he thinks it's a good song, but also because she's singing right to him. It is through music that they form their bond. When he finally sees someone he might be able to relate to, um, he just has to, to grab it before, before it goes away. He invites her up into his room, and he's like a little bit in awe of her. Your show, that song, <laughs> My dad gave me this guitar to apologize for being such a pathetic little dictator. She begins the education, and uh, I think Hedvig finds that uh, she got more than she bargained for. The student-teacher relationship is very erotic. Where are you from, Hedwig? I told him my story. Over time, Hedvig is telling this, this long story, and then the bomb explodes when he finally gets the punchline, which is, I had my penis cut off. There's something about him that comes out in the way he interprets finding out about her operation. I mean, what kind of God creates Adam in his image and then pulls Eve out of him to keep him company and then tells him, not to eat from the tree of knowledge. Tommy's take on it is characteristically Christian, and he sort of sees this myth of Adam and Eve. You know, Eve was inside Adam, and then they were separated, and that's when the trouble began. She took a bite of the apple, and she found out what was good and what was evil. She now becomes captivated with him. Now he's exposing the side of himself that she's identifying with. And so suddenly she falls in love with him right back. Hedwig, would you give me the apple? So she suddenly sees him as the possible other half, and uh, he sees her as Eve, you know, as the knowledge giver. He's Adam and she's Eve. I think the idea of the Adam and Eve scene for him was to see whether he could act in it and direct it. You know, I was going to meet John at uh, Sundance Filmmakers Lab, and uh, the, the thing that, that's so amazing about it is that it's a laboratory. What do you do in a lab? You conduct experiments. They give you a full crew. All these wonderful editors and DPs were right there, you know, and it's the most in incorruptible setting I've seen. John gave me a copy of the script. 
I read it and I said, I don't get it. Like, how are we going to stage this? How are we going to make this work? I didn't have any training. I didn't have any rules that I, I, I uh, had to follow. So I guess I approached it from the point of view of a, an actor. I mean, that song? My, my dad he gave me this guitar to apologize for being such a pathetic little dictator. <laughs> we opened it as seeing the two people very opposite each other. You want to hear some songs? And then we did a dolly around. We brought them together so they were very opposite, but as the camera moved around, they became over the shoulder. And then Hedwig ultimately sits down. We kept the camera going. And as they talk, they start, start leaning into each other, and the camera slowly dollied in, very imperceptibly. The kiss doesn't happen, and the camera actually, like, pulls back slowly, just breathes back. It's not overt, but the camera is sort of, is, is keeping a, a grip on the emotional content of the scene, sort of being led by it. So it comes in just as about as there to kiss, and then when the kiss fails, it sort of breathes back slowly. The way John filmed it, he filmed it much more from sort of a story and emotional point of view. I told him my story. Sort of played around with sound effects there. As if Hedwig is telling a war story. We used a lap dissolve. That was a locked off shot and you can see the sun moving. And that was actually inspired in the lab in the barn. There was actually like a skylight. And there was a brilliant piece of shaft of light came down, and uh, that's what we said, wow, that's great, why don't we like use that idea? Is that a mark? That is a mark, I don't really have you go that far down. Oh. I knew that uh, we couldn't do the overhead shot that we used in the lab because of the physical uh, space we were in. The location was completely different. At the lab we had a great big hall with a, with a 40 foot high ceiling. For the movie we had a practical set with a with a V-shaped ceiling that was at, at the most 10 or 12 feet high. We couldn't do that time-lapse scene, and I think also John felt confident that he wasn't losing anything. The idea then was how do we sort of spin these characters together. Frame. And action. As Hedwig starts walking around the bed, we used sort of this circling camera. Whenever we look at Tommy, the camera is also moving. Hedwig is moving and Tommy is moving, so this, the background is always sort of spinning. It's all sort of coming together. And that's sort of the idea, this is sort of coming together. And it all finally goes from all those intercut close-ups to finally to an eye. And then it sort of slowly pulls out to a big wide shot. There really was that luxury of being able to kind of like take an idea you know, squirt it out in the lab, you know, more aggressively, and then kind of refine it, hone it, uh, when we actually shot. For the most part, I'd say the scene in the movie is fairly closely related to the scene that we did in the lab. So, I mean, what it says to me is from the get-go, John had a really good idea. The story is organized basically around two different songs, which kind of divide the acts. And one of them is The Origin of Love, and the other is Wicked Little Town. Wicked Little Town is supposed to be the first song that Hedwig's ever written. It's coming out of where she's at right now in her life, that she's been living in this town that's dragging her down. And she can feel herself wearing out. And she's starting to play music again, and she's thinking, you're like, this is, this is my way out of here. You know the sun is in your eyes. When I wrote it, it was supposed to be so that she could write it for herself, but that he could also think it's for him. He loves the song, and, and he identifies so much with the themes that, that they can be just as much about him. So he kind of falls for her. She is his way out, and the song was the message. So she says, the fates are vicious and they're cruel. The fates are vicious and they're cruel. You learn too late, you use two wishes like a fool. You learn too late, you used two wishes like a fool. And then you're someone you are not, and Junction City ain't the spot. And then you're someone you are not, and Junction City ain't the spot. Remember Miss 
says locked in when she turned around. And if you've got no other choice, you know you can follow my voice through the dark turns and noises. Choice, you can follow my voice. The dark turns and noise of this wicked little town, um, and for her, that sort of following her own voice, her own muse, her her own creativity to use that to get her out of town. And for Tommy, he, he literally wants to follow her. Tommy's version of Wicked Little Town appears later when Hedwig has come to the end of her rope. She's followed her philosophy as far as it'll go and it's gotten her to a new bottom in her life. Um, and at this moment, uh, she has some sort of apparition of Tommy. He appears to her and he sings a version of Wicked Little Town back to her. You think that luck has left you there? He sings, you think that luck has left you there, but maybe there's nothing up in the sky but air. But maybe there's nothing up in the sky but air. And, and there's no mystical design. Mystical design. No cosmic lover pre-assigned. There's nothing you can nothing find that cannot be found. Can find Because with all the changes you've been through, it seems the stranger's always you. It seems the stranger's always you. Alone again in some new wicked little town. Basically saying, you know, you've got this philosophy, and the goal is to find your other half. And that the end result is always loneliness and despair. So maybe you don't need to find somebody else. You need to find what it is inside of you that, that you need to feel whole. For a songwriter to be able to tap into those things is a very powerful thing. And so I think that's, I think that's why music is so important for Hedwig and why it's important for her to realize that that's where she's going to find what she's looking for in that ability to write music. I think the hair and makeup is really important, especially this character, because a lot of it's about identity and finding yourself. And I think this is probably one of the main ways that Hedwig feels like she has an identity. I think Hedwig has a lot to compensate for because she is this gender confused person and she has to live her life as a woman. Her clothes and her hair and makeup is gonna help her pass. I wanted her to kind of be as much as possible, like all women, you know, sort of, you know, because she's a man and she probably comes into the situation where she has all these things and she can be whatever she wants to be. I definitely pulled from like Tammy Wynette, Ricky Lee Jones, Pamela Anderson's makeup, Dolly Parton, Chrissy Snow from Three's Company, because I think that that's what that character would have done. The challenge was to make the most authentic choice for the story. Well, I made a conscious effort to make all her performance outfits a bit sparkly and glamorous. And this was like something that I figured she could have made herself. And it was the beginning of where she would go in terms of her rock star stuff. It's her way of like dealing and putting her image out there for the other people to see and like what she other wants other people to perceive of her. In the Adam and Eve scene, when I really wanted John, as far as hair and makeup, to look like beautiful and someone that you know Tommy would be in love with and that was a strong person, um, we gave John bangs, which was really weird because it was the first time we did it and like people were just like shocked at how much of a woman he looked like in that look. <laughs> and that was really important for me to make 
Hedwig look like a woman. If she didn't, I think it would be, have been a failure, and I think it would have had a, kind of an impact on the film a lot. We wanted the clothes and the hair and makeup to be more believable, less sparkly, more matte, you know, the kind of antithesis of these performance scenes. You see Tommy in the scene as well, and he's wearing like a um, Born Again Christian t-shirt. I kind of modeled him off of the kind of 90210 archetype from the late 80s. This kind of like Hesher, Hesher style plaid pre-grunge, you know, mullet wearing kid. He's kind of supposed to be cheesy in a way because Hedwig sort of molds him into this rock star. Yeah! We didn't actually let him put any makeup on because of the fact that we wanted him to look kind of shiny and like, you know, if he had a zit, you know, like we were like, we're not covering it up, you know, because it makes him look like a young, young kid, you know. Hedwig is a very colorful, bright story. It's really challenging because you don't want to eclipse the reality that exists in this story or the emotion. So the important thing is to create a balance between that heightened reality that Hedvig is and can be and the, the subtleties in, in her character. I think the aesthetic was to embrace the emotion of the scene, to just let the camera tell the story and not like get on top of the action. And it made sense. I think the resulting scenes he did at Sundance Lab confirmed it was the way to go. You can say things emotionally in the song that sometimes you can't say any other way. And Hedwig is a songwriter. You know, she does express herself in her songs and says things in them that reveal what's going on inside her. That's why songs can be really effective. Costumes can help illustrate a character. They're a lot of fun and they're funny. And hopefully they serve the story. The scene had a lot of honing over the years from the theater piece to the Sundance Lab, to the actual shooting. So there really was that luxury of being able to kind of like take an idea and then kind of refine it, hone it, uh, when we actually shot. Too bad we don't get to see the Angry Inch. <laughs> that would be a great one for Industrial Light and Magic to create the Angry Inch. <laughs> it's remote controlled. <laughs>